Science of Golf Performance Show. I'm Alex. I'm Bobby. And I'm Chris. Make sure you give the video a like and subscribe to our channel before we start. We're really good, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> she was really nervous for that intro. <laughs> give her a like just for that intro. Yeah, please. <laughs> anyway, so talking about strength, smart strength training for golf. Evidence and data driven strength training for golf, too. Like, what does that even mean? It means objectively looking at where people improve, why it matters, and how to make it better quicker. Because there is a smart way, and there is a not so smart way to do it. Lots of not so smart ways to do it. Yeah, so I think starting off, kind of go into why would a golfer need strength? Um, I think if we look at your typical golf fitness workouts, uh, things on social media that you see a lot of the mobility parts, the, the balancing aspects, the stability parts, the unilateral movements, one leg, one arm, which all has its place as we've discussed in other podcasts and shows. Mm -hmm. um, but what is really a golf, it's a, it's a power sport, right? We need to be able to fall hard, we need to be able to control the ball as hard as we can. And the base of that power is going to come from strength. Now, I'm not a golfer, and I'm not a golf swing coach, but what I always tell my clients, our members, is that I can indirectly make you so much of a better golfer um, just from getting you stronger. Yeah. And I know, I have full confidence saying, like, I don't, my golf swing isn't very pretty, but I can get you swinging so much better, so much faster, and increase your golf score by not even giving you a golf ball or showing you a golf ball. Right, so I think one of the big things from my perspective, too, is the stronger you are and the stronger those muscles are, the healthier you're going to be, yeah. right? So it's going to protect your joints from wear and tear. It's mm -hmm. going to keep you playing for longer. Um, and two, it's not going to make you tired when you hit hole 18 or hole 19. Yeah. yeah. I think the big thing with strength and why it's important, I always describe like it's a layer of armor. Um, you know, think of you know, if your armor is real thin and somebody shoots an arrow at you, it's probably starts made of mesh. It's probably going to go right through. The thicker and the harder that armor is, you're going to survive more arrows. And I think that's in a, in a high volume repetition sport like when Wolf is, you get a lot of arrows shot at you over the course of the year, of the season, if you're competitive, <clears throat> just your lifetime, you know, through the 50s, 60s. And I think what happens is we see people who don't have a lot of strength because their armor is really thin and they get shot a lot. Yeah. And so they're injured. And go you know, to that person, and I'm sure you're watching this, you have a friend you know, maybe it's you who has that weekly appointment at the physio or the chiro because they've always got an ache or a pain or something that's going um, Yeah, so I think, to me, the importance of strength is it's your armor as a golfer. Um, but I think, like you other guys alluded to, there's so much just bad information <laughs> on so especially with social media, it's the worst place to go. Um, that, you know, hopefully the goal is to help you kind of sift through that and talk about what the research and the evidence actually says is helpful. So I think kind of what we need to define first is strength, like what is strength? Yeah. Uh, so in the simplest terms, strength is your body's ability to move weight, right? So if you're looking purely at strength, like we're talking about this episode, um, you know, a classic barbell movement, strength is defined by how much weight you can lift with those moves. Um, really any movement, it's about your muscle's ability to move weight. And what I think there's a kind of a misconception of which strength is in a golf swing and what power is in a golf swing and mobility. And what, what is strength not? Um, let's see. It's not swinging a weight. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> it's, it is not how much can you push while standing on an unstable surface. Um, you know, it's not standing on one foot and rowing. I think, I think that's where in golf we see a lot of misnomers and you know where it's like rehab on ends like strength training had a really ugly baby and it's and it doesn't it's not good for anyone right. uh it's like this no man's land of exercise that just gets termed strength or it's termed power i mean how many times do you see a post of somebody standing on one foot pushing something or pulling something with a cable and we're improving my power in the golf swing prove it because you won't be able to <laughs> Um, you're not moving enough weight, A, so you're not really maximizing force production because you're in an environment where you have to use so much of your muscle energy to just not fall over. And B, you're not moving it fast enough 
because I know you can move it faster on a two feet, which is how we play golf, FYI. Um, you know, so you're not going fast enough to produce speed, and you're not pushing enough load to increase your ability to produce force, which by definition is power. So I think there's a huge misnomer of that. Of it looks cool, and then you can theorize that, hey, if we can do it on one leg or you can do it on an unstable surface, it's going to be easier on the ground. Well, the data and the research is done. Right. <laughs> One of the most basic things to think about is the transfer of one activity to the next, right? Like you alluded to, golf is generally played on two feet, uh, or at least two points of contact with the ground. Um, you're rarely ever standing on one leg. You're rarely standing on a completely unstable, constantly moving surface. Unless you're in the follow-through, because somebody is going to say, well, you stand on one leg on the follow-through. But you're not creating power. <laughs> right. You're, you're right. Exactly. Uh, so making sure that what you're doing, you know, with your precious time in the gym um, carries over as best as possible to your golf game is probably the most important aspect of it. So what we're always looking for is what's the most efficient exercises and what's the most efficient way to spend my time in the gym so that when I go to the range, when I go to the course, I know I've made myself better. Why don't we, in, a, in an attempt to avoid getting into the emotional arguments of this exercise is better than that exercise, let's talk like uh, the bigger picture, what type of exercise, regardless of what you're doing, you know, what's the best type of strength training uh, I call it method or whatever you want to call it? Uh, what, is, you know, what would you recommend? Yeah, I think there's a few routes we can go down with that. And, you know, one that we use as a compliment that's, you know, evidence based to be extremely effective in building strength um, is a tri basic type of approach. Um, with tri basic, we're focusing on time under tension, um, eccentric load, isometric load, and then conversion to power and concentric. Um, so eccentric kind of started with that. We're controlling our negative part of movements, whatever exercise you're doing, um, elongating that time under tension. Um, so that being so okay. Yeah, so example, if we're doing a squat, uh, say you're doing a goblet squat, an eccentric portion of the lift, and there's an eccentric portion in almost every single lift or movement that you do, um, the downward portion of that lift going down into the squat is going to be your eccentric portion of that lift. So really maximizing uh, that part, of that portion of the movement by going slow down, feeling that tension in the muscles. Um, you know, you're putting a lot more stress on the muscle, less on the joint by doing that. Um, it's helping us elongate the muscle and create that muscle's ability to produce more force when we come up from that squat. Uh, so that's one third of the track is. But um, triphasic wasn't the best for everyone. And, and obviously, this triphasic is very well researched. We looked at it, I guess, specifically. Mm -hmm. I guess I should let you speak to that since you're a research guy. But. Yeah, so we looked at, you know, is this better for our developing junior athletes or is that approach better for our older adult athletes? And what we found was that actually our older adult athletes responded to the type of training that Alex is talking about the best, um, forcing someone to control that range of motion. Um, from a physical therapy side of things that can also help elongate the muscles. So um, talking about efficiency, right? If you're trying to get more range of motion and get stronger, this is a perfect way to do it. Um, so with our junior or developing athletes, though, we just found that a basic, you know, hey, when can we add more weight to the bar for this athlete? That seems to be the best approach for them. Obviously, making sure their form was perfect, making sure that the athlete was able to control the movement Right, and then how much weight can we put on it? And it's not just that it seemed to be. I mean, it was 60% better. Right. <laughs> so the, the pack for the juniors, we were just adding the weight up. That outperforms. You know, we looked at our data, right, which was what's the average, no matter what exercise program somebody's doing. Mm -hmm. And then if we had a junior do triphasic, they actually underperformed that average. Right. It was, uh, I think it was like 10%. Mm -hmm. But if they did traditional training, then they actually outperformed that average by like 40 or so. Right. And then it was flipped for tri physics for the adults, yeah. um, which was really interesting. So regardless, I think, of what exercise you're doing, think about that yeah. <laughs> uh, in terms of when you're looking at implementing your year-long plan and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Well, I think the, the second part I'm going to is the isometric portion of that tri basic uh, type training. Now, the isometric part is going to be no lengthening or expanding of the muscle. It's when you're holding that spot at the bottom. Uh, actively holding too, so you're not just kind of going down sitting at the bottom or the press, you're not just resting the bar on your, your chest, you're actively holding that bar, actively mm -hmm. holding that position at the bottom. 
Um, again, creating your your muscles' ability to store more uh, ability to produce more force. Um, another part of the the research that we saw, just a part of the program that we saw to increase in adults. Um, and then the third one to go into would just be the concentric portion, uh, the coming up from the squat, the coming up from the bench press, taking that stored energy that we've built in the eccentric and the isometric, you really see what we can produce coming up, because that's when we're producing the power, and that's how we're going to see the strength gains by utilizing that. But I think, in, I think we always recommend kind of the post-activation potentiation element as well, uh, which we use when we do a squat, we then go and do some form of a jump, a right. triple extension work. Uh, if you're 50 and you're worried about jumping, caveman throws, there's other, lots of other options for you to do. And we talked about those in a separate episode. So. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Go yeah, look at the episode. caveman throw if you're interested in that. Yeah, and I think also, um, you know, then looking at, I guess the plyometric or the medicine ball, I guess would be a better one. The periodizing your medicine ball, but we change the type of medicine ball or the throws that we do based on what phase we're in, right? So, for uh, Mike's help, you speak to you do all the program. Yeah, so for if we're more in an eccentric focus phase, um, we're going to do more of a hop back uh, throw, Iron Man, or scoop throws, depending on what the program calls for. Um, you know, I'm kind of eccentrically hopping back to absorb that force before I produce it. Uh, for a more of an isometric phase, we're gonna do a static scoop throw or a static Iron Man, and then step into the concentric phase. So we're getting a little more force going into it. Um, and this kind of complements just the eccentric, isometric, concentric portions. We found to complement it very well. Yeah, well I think that's, that's our opinion. We haven't researched that just as we kind of call others out um, when they don't feel we say this definitely works. Yep. That, that's our that's guess at this point, Ed, educated guess. Um, so, but that's one of the things we're going to be looking at is kind of does it really or not. So, uh, I think one of the big things we're always looking at in here is what's the best way to assess strength. So, some of you that might be watching at home might be asking, like, well, do I really need to strength train? If you're not strength training already, the answer would be yes, right? I think we could agree on that. Um, but then if you might be strength training and you're hitting a plateau, you might be wondering, hey, how much more do I need for my golf game? Or is there another way that I can, you know, continue my progress to help me swing faster, help me stay healthy? I think the triphasic training that you talked about, Alex, has been a game changer for all of our members that utilize it. Um, but then how else would you say, you know, how do we want to assess strength, whether we need to add more weight to the bar or if we need to go in a different direction? Right. I think one of the best ways is just to do strength tests, like absolute strength tests. Um, if you have a client, we have our members who are pretty proficient in movements and the technicalities and everything, we're going to see what their absolute strength is for a three to five rep max. Um, and then that's how we trust, track progress over time. You know, three to four months or so, we will do a strength test, see how it's going along. And our goal for the in season is to help them maintain or not lose more than a percent or two of their strength. Uh, that's a win. We do that, and in the off season, if we can, help, that's a time to build. So we retest. We want to see those numbers go up a little bit. And um, it, in the in season, like I said, uh, if we see strength go up, that's a win as well. But you know, as long as we're not losing a ton, uh, that's a win. Well, I think we're as a little teaser for you. Uh, you know, we're pretty close. I'd say filming of this video three to three months, six months away. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to tell you how strong, is strong enough, in and in a relative. So Alex is talking about absolute meaning. Can you lift 150 pounds? Right. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Relative. It's if you weigh 150 pounds, you lift it 100% of your body weight. Um, so there is looking like there's a point where there is strong enough. And then we won't necessarily get into it in this episode, but that's how we start talking about velocity based training, EBT, as it's called. Yeah. Um, so that's we start getting more complex. But um, I think that's a pretty good opening. Kind of answering evidence based. The training, right? Yeah. Um, that's what you, and there's obviously you don't have to do it this exact way, uh, but I think understanding that a barbell is, probably, is the tried and true tool <laughs> to get more load. If you don't, strength training to me is real simple, right? And if you don't get enough load on your tissue, you don't get stronger. Yeah, right? I was going to say what I meant to include in that is we're three to five rep maxing our compound movements, our squat, right. our bench, and our deadlift. Not a split squat, right? Not ten to three rep maxing. Hammered curl. Yeah, 
I do sing on camera curls personally. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the more the movements that you can put the more load on, um, bilaterally will increase your strength. Yeah, I think you just what you run into with dumbbells and how you can only hold so much weight, and your arms are going to become your bigger limiting factor than your legs. Right. Um, and if that's the case, you're not really testing your true strength. So, so um, you can't get objective. How do you know if it works? Enough. But uh, anyway, I think we're uh, we're running towards the end here. I think yeah. we've uh, we can go on for this for days. But, um, any other kind of thoughts, guys? You have thoughts? I think it's important for every golfer to engage in some type of strength training program. Obviously, finding something that's the right fit for you, um, but really making sure that you're putting enough load on your muscles. A lot of the stuff that you're going to see on social media is just not quite cutting it in terms of actually helping you get stronger. So, it looks golfy though. <laughs> All right. Well, if uh, you found this content helpful, please subscribe to the channel, like it, uh, like this video, share it with your friends uh, or with your golfers or your clients, whatever it may be. Um, but until next time, see you later.